Hello, Austin. How is everyone? Great to see you all. My name is Michael Tannenbaum. I'm a co-founder at Mycelial. And while it would be uh, my dream to be with you all in person, I'm speaking to you today remotely about AIML at the extreme edge with WebAssembly, a path forward. Today, we're going to be talking about what WebAssembly is, why it's a good fit for AIML at the edge, um, what are the struggles and challenges of delivering AIML at the extreme edge that WebAssembly can really help us catapult forward, and what are some of the peripheral challenges that turn out to be not so peripheral when we're trying to deliver AIML solutions at the extreme edge. Just by way of a little bit of background, I am the, as I mentioned, one of the co-founders at Mycelial. And previous to Mycelial, I was a principal solutions engineer at Aricto working on uh, Kubeflow, which is a an AIML end-to-end uh, -end solution that runs on Kubernetes, originally came out of uh, uh, Google and now is being adopted by a wider audience. I was uh, privileged enough to work on a, a SIG for the on-premises uh, community for the Kubeflow project. And before that, I was a principal solutions engineer and the AIML practice lead at Mesosphere, now named D2IQ. So just very quickly to give you a little bit of context about what Mycelial does, help you understand why it is that we come into contact so often with projects relating to AIML at the extreme edge, is uh, we are the edge native platform for distributed local first applications. And what that really means is that we combine conflict-free replicated data types, which we'll be talking about later because they have a lot of relevance for the extreme edge in a lot of different cases, not just AIML, uh, with WebAssembly to make it easy to create distributed applications in these highly constrained environments. And our goal is to make it just as easy as making a local application that you might run on your laptop or on a, on a server in the cloud. Mycelial as a company was founded last year. We uh, raised about $3.8 million from Crane Venture Partners. Um, Anil Akani is in the audience today from Crane. And if you uh, really wanna get a, a perspective that's fantastic on the market as particularly in these sorts of uh, uh, areas, I would encourage you to communicate with him. Um, we work with large enterprises that are looking to deliver um, scaled, products in the field. So think US uh, Department of Defense, uh, large retailers with a big physical footprint. And you'll see why we focus on these folks when you when you get a little bit more of a, a sense for where we're coming from. So I mentioned that we're the edge native platform for distributed local first applications, but uh, it's just a bunch of buzzwords. What does that actually mean? What the heck is even edge native? Well, cloud native is a term most of us are familiar with. And cloud native is really defined sort of by the benefits it provides over any particular or specific architecture. So with cloud native tools, we were, we were able to meet the challenges of web scale, starting at huge companies like Twitter, Facebook, Google, Airbnb, and so on. And all cloud native tools are designed around the goal of providing scale, agility, velocity, and hopefully without a lot of headache. And the, however, the limitation there is that cloud native tools focus of course on the cloud. So racks of servers in a data center, either your own or borrowed from, from somebody else, like one of the big three cloud providers and so on. Um, and the applications that run there are cloud applications. So we can think of them as sort of data center applications. When we at Mycelial and hopefully you <laughs> at the end of this presentation, uh, think about when we think about the edge, we think about anything that runs outside the data center. So for us, the goal of edge native is to provide that same scale, agility and velocity, um, but for applications that run outside the data center. So we would call these real world applications. And these can be from a variety of different perspectives. So for us, something that runs in a browser tab, it's outside a data center, it's an application, we would call that an edge application. Then more traditional uh, considerations of, of edge, things like the internet of things um, or mobile and so on. These, these, of course, smart meters, other types of smart devices that exist in the real world. Um, anything outside the data center for us 
is the edge. So edge native is not a term that we invented, but it's one we are uh, promoting and, and trying to encourage people to think about given the change, given the change in circumstance, the, the different constraints that exist outside the data center versus inside the data center. After all, most people, you know, don't uh, don't have racks of servers in their home or something like that. Maybe this audience, I, I shouldn't say, but uh, most people don't don't have access to those tools on on certainly on their phone or perhaps on a smart thermostat or on their robotic vacuum cleaner, that sort of thing. The constraints are are different. The challenges are different. And therefore, we need to think about our tooling and what the what the challenges are that we're trying to overcome differently. And so from our perspective, there is indeed a need to consider separate architectures and separate uh, sets of tooling for the edge because of course those constraints are different. But at the end of the day, cloud native and edge native both are defined by the goals that they seek to deliver to the end user, that being scale, agility, and velocity. We could probably add a few other uh, uh, descriptors there. Um, but generally, that's the the focus of today's conversation is around everything that runs outside of the data center. And after all, uh, the extreme edge is just an even more challenging version of the edge. So uh, you were probably expecting something to that effect as well. So the question that a lot of people uh, ask when when we first start considering AI, ML, and the edge is to borrow a phrase or to, to paraphrase uh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, what is the deal with AI, ML at the edge? Okay, that'll be the last time I attempt to impersonate uh, Jerry Seinfeld. You're welcome. Um, and the reason is what I like to say is that if, if you're a human being or even a machine, if you're interacting with a computer and you're not pointing and clicking in 2022, you're using AI ML. What do I mean by that? If you're in your home and you say, hey, Alexa, hey, Google, hey, Siri, you're using AI ML and your interaction modality there, of course, is speech. Um, if we're using our mobile phone or our computer, we point and click. That's a fairly standard modality. But if we want to talk to our computer, if we want our computer, and I'm speaking computer very generally here, if we want our computer to recognize our face in order to uh, give us, uh, 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 to authenticate us, if we want our car to be able to view the world like a human driver and react, uh, hopefully even better potentially than, than a human driver uh, would, that's using AI ML. In 2022, I can't tell you what will happen in the future, but in, in 2022, AI ML is the way that we can interact with more human modalities like speech, vision, uh, and, and so on in order to interact with a computer and accomplish what it, whatever our, our goal happens to be. So because the interface between humans and computers outside of pointing and clicking requires AI ML, and because humans live in the real world, therefore we need to deliver AI ML at the edge. Now you may be saying, well, Michael, why can't I just take all that data and centralize it to some centralized server and in a data center somewhere and then beam back the results? Well, the reason is because for many safety critical situations, really in any situation on the edge, you have to consider the reality, not the chance of, but indeed the reality of um, disconnection. And that's that's a that's a very real uh, that's a very real constraint. And you'll see it throughout the discussion today. If we take one step below the surface though and we we actually look at what is the common pattern that exists in the ai ml at the edge world there's a a wonderful talk that was given actually quite mm, 2017 i believe it was um by peter levine who is a uh, retired partner uh formerly of uh andreessen horowitz and he gave a talk uh it's publicly accessible if you just google the source below called the end of cloud computing, in which he imagines a world uh, that is fast upon us, whereby the quantity of data generated at the edge and the need to make real-time decisions at the edge, again, anything outside the data center, without 
uh, reliance on connectivity without suffering the challenges, not just of latency, but inconsistent latency. Elon Musk talks about this uh, quite a bit with, with Tesla, where it's called jitter, where we, don't, we can't actually even plan around the latency because the latency itself is inconsistent. Ultimately, all of these projects boil down to more or less four different steps. And Peter Levine created this framework that I think is, is really uh, quite compelling. The first thing we want to do in an AI ML application at the edge is sense something. We want to determine uh, what's going on in our world and if it's something that we need to evaluate uh, as a uh, and make a decision about, which comes to our second point. So we need to take that sensory data and then we need to plug it into an AI ML model. We need to create a an inference about what that data actually means. So I'll give an example. Um, if I'm a, a self-driving car and I have much image data coming into me, I need to be able to make a decision as to whether it's safe to continue driving, for example, or whether we need to come to a stop. After I've made that inference, I then need to act on it. So we have to flow data from the sensory tooling, the sensors, and to be quite literal, into an inference engine, that's your AI ML model, and then that AI ML model's inference needs to then be flowed into a separate set of applications connected to perhaps something physical, perhaps uh, an alerting mechanism to then take an action. And then lastly, and sort of asynchronously from the first four, we want to actually use the data that we're collecting at the edge in an intelligent way to actually make our models stronger. And in many cases, as, as conditions shift over time, for example, uh, a movie on Netflix may become very popular and then everyone's seen it. So why do we want to keep recommending it? We need to learn from what users, what the world is teaching us out in the real world, S take that data and actually make our models uh, 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 better, hopefully, or at a minimum, at least update them. That learn function actually has a very interesting opportunity, especially when it comes to the edge and especially when it comes to WebAssembly as it relates to privacy. So today, the way that substantially all uh, AIML training jobs run in a centralized location. So we take all of your data, we hoover it up right to the cloud, we plug it into some ETL process and prepare it, pre-process it, run a training job on it, and then push those, those models back down to the edge. But wouldn't it be wonderful for your own privacy and mine if instead we could run a training job locally on a local set of data and then extract the learnings, not the actual raw data that contains your private information, but the learnings from that uh, back to a centralized source so that it could be amalgamated with other uh, learnings from other users, other uh, cars, trucks, planes, boats, plane, uh, boats, trains, and so on um, out in the field uh, without actually needing to centralize quite all of that data. And that's really the crux of Peter Levine's argument here. He's saying that the quantity of data generated at the edge far outpaces our ability, just pure bandwidth wise, to centralize it. And indeed, each individual high fidelity data point that's generated at the edge doesn't need to be centralized if we're going to learn from it. So the opportunity to run sophisticated code at the edge, which as we'll see is a wonderful fit for WebAssembly, the opportunity to, to deliver sophisticated code on smaller footprint devices um, and to be able to extract the learnings from that is a huge advantage that WebAssembly does indeed open up for us. We'll see why. So just as a, a, a moment to, to establish my, uh, my credibility in this arena, uh, I have attempted to put cloud native uh, tooling on a wide variety of different edge locations. And I'll be honest with you all, they all failed. Uh, I've tried to put Kubernetes on a submarine. I've tried to put Spark uh, on a, a robotic arm. I've attempted to um, create centralized repositories for elect, uh, uh, electric car charging stations to do uh, training uh, at the edge, as well as inference at the edge, a whole variety of, of different toolings that I've, uh, different, excuse me, different locations where I've, I've tried to put Kafka, Spark, uh, Cassandra, Flink, all of these cloud native tools that work great in the cloud, they just 
they're just really not designed for smaller devices. Think Raspberry Pi um, and so on. And in particular, they really don't they don't shine at the edge. And the reason is because the edge is not a data center. I mean, a data center is, if you think about it, a fairly contrived uh, uh, location. There's, if you're in a data center, you know you're in a data center, right? There's racks and racks of servers. They all have tremendous connectivity. They have huge nowadays, you know, huge amounts of CPU and memory. Um, and cloud native tooling, to its credit, takes advantage of that environment. So it relies on the fact that there's plenty of memory, plenty of CPU. Uh, 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 near constant connectivity, you know, as a just as a quick aside, we always like to say that uh, um, uh, when you're talking about the edge, your your disconnection is not an error state. But if one of your Kubernetes nodes is disconnected, well, someone's going to get a page and and very likely uh, will need to come in and and fix that situation. Whereas for some of uh, the work that that uh, we and others do if you're talking about, for example, an autonomous uh, a naval vessel that spends six months of the year under the water. Well, disconnection is actually part of the game there. That's that's not an error state. That's just, you know, regular operations. And then, of course, these tools are 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 quite ops intensive. So if we're going to be running our own uh, uh, Cassandra, someone has to feed and care for that database. Same with Kafka, Spark, Flink, uh, any Kubernetes, any any of these. Uh, cloud native uh, tools. And because they know these tools were designed to have access to a ton of bandwidth, they rely on that bandwidth. So if anyone's looked at uh, uh, logs from a Kubernetes cluster, it's it's a mind boggling amount of uh, messaging that goes uh, uh, between different uh, applications and different nodes in those clusters. It's, it's very uh, bandwidth heavy, which in the data center is perfectly fine. On the edge, when moving a, a, a kilobyte of data could cost a million times more than it does sitting uh, in, an, in a single availability zone in the public cloud, we have to think a lot harder about what we want to actually be putting over the wire. So can WebAssembly help us? Absolutely it can. Um, I list on the bottom here a couple of resources that I found to be particularly useful in my journey with uh, WebAssembly, the Bytecode Alliance. Uh, has some wonderful resources. Lynn Clark, if you uh, look them up on, on YouTube, unbelievably uh, helpful uh, cartoons and, and diagrams to discuss uh, uh, WebAssembly, and then of course, WebAssembly.org. So what, let's take a quick review for the folks who may not know a little bit, uh, may not be as familiar with WebAssembly. What, with, what is WebAssembly? Well, WebAssembly is an intermediate representation, and essentially it's a, it's a compile target. So other languages compile into WebAssembly, and then WebAssembly is then run in different environments. So one of the interesting things about WebAssembly is that you're already using it. Every single browser uh, in the world supports, uh, supports WebAssembly, as far as I can't think of an exception. Um, and it's been out in public for a very long uh, time in the world of the browser virtual machine. What's changed is now folks are starting to realize, well, not now, the past few years, are starting to realize, hey, we have this wonderful technology that's incredibly small, can provide near native performance, can uh, be created, compiled to from many different languages, has some wonderful secure by default uh, functionality involved, and provides a, a, a standard system interface. After all, uh, we all have browsers on our machine, for example. And so now folks are starting to realize, well, how can we use this not only in a browser environment or in a headless browser environment, like a V8 engine or something like that, but also uh, directly on a machine through uh, runtimes like uh, Wasm time, Wasm 3, um, and uh, and others. So here are the key properties of WebAssembly. You can you know look it up that we don't have time in this discussion to go all the way through. Here's the key properties of WebAssembly for you. Super tiny. We can compile it down to very, we can take complex apps and high level languages and get them running in very small footprints. Near native performance, um, uh, we can get within about 90% of native. And if you're talking about a small device, think Raspberry Pi, being able to, to, to extract all of that performance is, is critically important. As I mentioned, it's polyglot, so we can 
uh, compiled from 35 different languages into WebAssembly. I should say that some languages have more functionality at this time than others. This is a wonderful place if you're looking to uh, invest in the community to, to help grow it, is actually to help expand uh, and create a, a, a more profound uh, um, set of resources for taking other languages and, and compiling them to WebAssembly. Uh, it's secure by default, so every file every every system permission needs to be permissioned explicitly so reading a file writing a file uh opening a network socket and so on and uh in a in a wonderful uh i don't want to say accident of history perhaps we're in a new era um the WebAssembly system interface the the uh spec for running WebAssembly outside of a browser directly on a machine uh, has has a great community alignment behind it. There's still a huge amount of work to be done. Again, a wonderful area for folks to invest if you're looking to contribute to a particular uh, project or or area within the WebAssembly universe. Uh, being able to 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 expand out not only what is defined in the spec, but also the implementation of the WebAssembly system interface spec um, is a is a great way to look, a great place to look. So. Let me make this the sort of challenges of of uh, AIML at the extreme edge a little bit more uh, concrete with a case study. So this is a project that uh, myself and and a few of my colleagues in the audience as well uh, had the privilege to work on, where we were working with a, a global manufacturing co conglomerate, and what we were trying to do was do on machine anomaly detection. This is something that's very popular these days, and the reason is because if we can get a little bit of a heads up as to when one of these large manufacturing machines is going to um, fail. Uh, then we don't have unplanned maintenance. And when you're talking about a very large organization, sometimes you know it can be it, it's not immediately obvious, but we're talking about a hundred thousand dollars of losses per hour that that machine is down without uh, being planned for. And the second and and even more important reason, of course, is that if a machine fails in an unexpected way, it could lead to human injury. And that's certainly not something that that uh, uh, we want. And then lastly, the thing to remember that, again, is the, the key to the edge is that cloud connectivity in these cases is unreliable. So some of these manufacturing facilities are in uh, places with absolutely fantastic uh, network connectivity. Others are in uh, very remote locations that have intermittent connectivity or uh, very expensive uh, connectivity over satellite or something like that. So um, uh, we need to be able to handle all of the decisions and all of the 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 sovereignty over the the data needs to remain local. It cannot have a cloud dependency. So the good news is we were using a, a TensorFlow model. The good news is that compiling TensorFlow uh, to WebAssembly, there's uh, a few different mechanisms. Um, if you're interested, I would take a look at um, an organization called Hammer of the Gods. Uh, Hotg.ai is their uh, website. They've got some really interesting work around WebAssembly containers and um, con containerizing within WebAssembly ETL and data pipelines, as well as serving and monitoring models uh, at the edge. Uh, great folks, uh, open source product, highly, highly recommended. Uh, to take a look at that, but there there are quite a few different mechanisms you can you know certainly play around with them. But okay, so we've got our model compiled to WebAssembly, but as we saw in the sense infer act learn step, there's actually quite a bit of data flow that needs to happen in order to make that work. And indeed, when we're talking about a connected factory, it's not enough just to take the sensor data from one machine, plug it into a model running on that machine, and then making an, uh, a, a decision, taking an action based off of that. In fact, we may have dozens, hundreds, even thousands of connected machines of different types that actually need to coordinate together. And again, we can't rely on a cloud centralized service in order to orchestrate all of those uh, all of those different applications. And we characterize the the edge native challenges not only uh, in terms of actually delivering the physical application that is the the model and the inferencing engine, but three additional big challenges. 
the, they're all data challenges. The first is we need to have populate and handle our local data as the source of truth because we don't know whether we will have access to uh, peers or 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 other services within within the environment. I, as a manufacturing machine or as a robot, need to be able to make sense of my world independently. But then I also need to interact with others. So as I come into and out of connectivity, I need to be able to resolve and and zip up, if you will, or merge my data with the understanding of the world that others have. Indeed, I may be out of date, they may be out of date. So I need to be able to uh, merge the data and, and synchronize the data. without conflict so i need a guarantee a mathematically proven guarantee that the that the the state will converge to a single uh, uh state among all of the peer applications that need to share that state in a way that's conflict free and then lastly as discussed before we need to think about bandwidth differently here we can't uh we, we we need to be smart about what and how we put over the wire because it can be so expensive whether we're talking about uh, L, uh lte 5g and so on so it turns out that there is a wonderful technology called conflict-free replicated data types that solve just this problem and as the name suggests Conflict-free replicated data types are a data type, so something that looks like a primitive, like an integer or a string, instead uh, be and behaves like that under the covers, in fact, has a synchronization uh, component to it. So we actually push all of the logic for synchronizing and, and merging data in a conflict-free way into the data type itself. So conflict-free replicated data types are just one of the most fascinating uh, new technologies. You can think about them almost like Google Docs, which is to say that your when you when you uh, use a, a Google Doc or a collaborative document editor, um, all of the conflicts between if I change something, you change something, it's going to converge onto a single state, and everyone will see the same state at the end of the day. So conflict-free replicated data types guarantee that all the peers that share a state in fact converge to the same state regardless of the order in which they received a given message or a given update which if you think about in an offline first local first disconnection uh, uh heavy environment can be absolutely critical because it means that if i'm disconnected from all the other peer applications all the other machines are sharing state and i'm over here completely isolated it means that when i reconnect i can um, my state will be converged, so I don't need to worry about mutating my data locally. And you can see how that looks uh, over here with the, the example on the right. So, uh, for example, in the first machine, the messages are received in the order A, B, and C, and the resulting document is uh, A, B, C. In the second machine, receives the messages in the order C, B, A, and by virtue of the algorithm, converges to ABC. And the last one, same thing, receives it in a completely in a third order and again converges to ABC. So it doesn't matter for how long I'm disconnected. When I rejoin, I am guaranteed to share the state of every other one and, and be consistent on that, which is incredibly powerful because now as an engineer, I don't have to write all that logic. It's just in the data type itself. To make it a little bit more concrete, uh, I just wanted to give an example. This is an actual unit test. I've left the mycelial logo on here specifically so that you know that this is our open source uh, uh, web assembly based uh, CRDT uh, engine. Don't want to say that every CRDT works like this, but it's it's this is how our open source CRDT engine uh, works, how the mycelial library works, but this is generally a good idea. So let's just sort of take a quick look at how CRDTs are able to do that. So here at the top, you can see we create two new list CRDTs. On the first one, we append the word hello. The word hello. On the second, we append world, and then we generate a diff by sharing uh, the by passing the vector clocks of the opposite one 
to to the other that's essentially saying hey these are all the unique updates i have which are the unique updates that you have in this case one has hello the other has world and then we apply the diff and by virtue of the magic of, of, of vector clocks, which we don't have time to get into today, they converge, you can see here, down to hello world, hello world, strictly ordered in, in that way. So even though the first one had hello and the other one had world, they converge always to, to the same way, uh, to the same state. Now, you may be saying, well, how do I know what state it's going to converge to? Great question. There's no promise that it's the state you necessarily intended or wanted, but once it's converged, you can then take additional steps to say, okay, let's manipulate this data. Let's have some trigger that that uh, that deals with it. So when it comes down to what we actually need to deliver AIML at the extreme edge, WebAssembly is a wonderful tool um, and a wonderful framework to be able to provide that. And we can take our AIML models and uh, compile them to WebAssembly, and that's great. But we can use WebAssembly actually for some of the, the data flow, a lot of the data flow as well. And conflict-free replicated data types are, in my opinion, the, the future for that because they just work in the local first, uh, conflict-free, uh, bandwidth optimized way. And when they come together, what we get is a, a, a very interesting paradigm for, for edge native that I find particularly compelling, where we have safer, cheaper, faster applications, faster systems that are scaled to uh, human beings. After all, that's the goal here is to be able to take a, a digital process that is indeed very um, sort of uh, uh, not unnatural, but but completely a natural. It's it's, uh, it's it's synthetic, and using um, AI ML, using really deep learning, let it interface with the organic world, with with people, and allow us to interact with computers much in the same way that we interact with humans and much in the same way that we expect of humans. So for example, if a, if a person looks at you, you know they're looking at you. If a computer looks at you, well, they need computer vision, AI ML to do that. Thank you all so much for um, uh, coming to my presentation. I have colleagues, as I mentioned, in the audience who will, who will be there, happy to chat with you as well. Um, please do check out uh, Mycelial online. We're an open source company. We would welcome your collaboration and participation. Um, and we're super active on our Discord. So please do join up or follow us on uh, social. Thanks, everyone.